Hi, everyone. Uh, we're super excited to be here with you at DASA Connect 2023. And today we are going to share with you some of our experiences that we've had over the past decade or so, experiencing and observing the rise and fall of DevOps. I'm Brian Fenster. I'm a value stream architect with Defense Unicorns. We deliver products that help teams solve the most challenging software delivery problems. An example, if you need to deliver, if you need continuous delivery in a submarine, you should probably talk to us. I'm Dana Fenster. I've been a software developer for many years. I've led grassroots transformation through community building, and I'm currently also leading a developer platform, developer and delivery platform. Um, and between us, we have about 50 years of experience delivering software in very large organizations, um, both kind of badly mm. and, and also pretty well. So we can't really start to talk about DevOps without getting on the same page and aligning what we're talking about when we say DevOps. It's kind of unfortunately named and a lot of people get different images in their head when they hear the word DevOps. So DevOps is people, process, and products working together to enable the continuous delivery of value to the end user. And that's people first, using lean process with products and tools to enable orchestration and automation. And it, it's a lot of people. You know, early on, I had an opportunity to experience success with this. We had an SVP who challenged us to move from quarterly to bi-weekly delivery. And I, I say quarterly uh, generously. Sometimes it was only three times a year. Uh, he didn't know how, but he trusted us to solve the problem on engineering. He trusted us when we said, hey, we need to build a platform that will make continuous delivery easy. He trusted us when we said we need to do continuous delivery instead of delivering every two weeks. He encouraged community, learning, and sharing believed us you know that that daily delivery was super important for improved feedback and to improve quality he gave us air cover to throw away the agile scaling framework we were using that was really preventing us to deliver the way we needed to he incentivized the managers in the area to support the changes we were making and to support the teams making them. and the outcomes we got from that were faster time to market higher quality and most importantly to me better morale as a you know for development teams it, it made us love development again. And that's why I'm personally so passionate about this way of working. You know, and, and things changed. SVP left the area, as did the director who was, uh, you know, kind of leading the effort on the ground. And the new director focused on output and utilization rather than outcomes. He pushed for teams to have CD automation without the same focus on learning the CD mindset and workflows that are so important to quality. Because of that quality suffered, and then we lost the trust of the business. Morale suffered. We'd seen improvement, and now it's going backwards. And, and ultimately, engineers with the knowledge of how that happened burned out and left the area. Some left the company. They were just so upset. And the hard-won improvements were lost, and the area never really recovered. It was, for me personally, heartbreaking. Yeah, achieving that success and then living through the downfall is really demoralizing. But, you know, also, sometimes companies just end up with no DevOps. Sometimes they never get an opportunity to fail because they can't get started in the first place. I've seen a couple of anti-patterns that I've the at various organizations. One is creating a DevOps role or a DevOps team that sits between Dev and Ops to facilitate communication and coordination. This is the exact opposite of the goal to improve the system by minimizing handoffs and silos. As at one organization where there was a focus on building a centralized platform to enable continuous delivery, a solid goal. And we started to define those good practices for continuous delivery to enable them in our pipelines. But then the goal shifted to just getting everybody onboarded so that all pipelines use this tool. This resulted in requests to build our CD pipelines in order to allow everyone to use their current practices. This wasn't scalable. It didn't encourage learning the new skills needed to really improve or the practices for effective continuous delivery. The platform that could have been an enticement to really improve our engineering excellence became a checkbox. Yep, 
we are using the DevOps tools. You know, there's there is no strategic value in doing the DevOps without understanding that it's more than tools or without understanding how it actually will help us achieve our goals. It can be really hard to start and sustain that journey because DevOps permeates the entire organization. It's really frustrating to achieve that success and be thrown backward or struggle to introduce that success to a new team or organization. And we've both experienced it from, from living this and having many conversations with other people in the community from various organizations, we started finding repeating patterns around the rise and the fall, you know, success and failures in DevOps. So we started thinking, you know, what, how can organizations really achieve and sustain DevOps? What's causing this fall? What's causing the problems? Because we know and we've experienced the how well it works. So we started asking ourselves, <clears throat> what fundamentals are necessary? What's breaking to cause this regression? And what, what are the dependencies where we're getting the cascading effects, both positive and negative? And we came up with a better DevOps tool chain. This is our chain made up of six links that we consider to be the foundations of DevOps and all are necessary for success. Mission, structure, ownership, platform, learning, and trust. Once they're all built, it's very important to continuously monitor which of these are missing or might be starting to break because any weaknesses in a single link can begin the fall of the entire system. So we're gonna dive into each of these and share ways to break them and also ways to forge them. We can't really start finding ways to improve our system and deliver faster until we know what we need to deliver. Why? What's the mission? And it's important to have a good mission because if we have some misguided missions, things can go really off the rails. We can really harm what we're trying to accomplish. If missions are inwardly focused rather than improving value, or if they're uninspiring, or worse, just unachievable. You know, let's become Dora Elite. I mean, this is literally a mission that I've seen teams given, a goal. You know, it has nothing to do with helping the customer. It's all about, hey, we've got some metric that someone said we should look at. We're going to make that better. I was even inspired to write a white paper for IT Revolution about the problems this causes and how to avoid them. It's called how to misuse and abuse Dora metrics. I've also seen zero defects given as a mission. Zero defects sounds really good in theory. Uh, in practice, it drives poor behaviors. We were given zero defects as a mission and told it would be impacting our evaluations if we were uh, delivering defects. That creates fear, creates longer feedback loops as we add process, to make sure we have zero defects. And pushing this mission ultimately is self-defeating because the longer feedback loops mean that we are less likely to detect problems early on. But there are better missions. In another organization, our CTO gave us a really hard mission. He said, I want every team to be able to go to production and deliver business value daily. So it's just hard. I mean, you're talking about people don't normally deliver that quickly. And, and, but why that mission? Because it's hard. It inspired people to find better ways to get things done. It inspired communities and sharing. And we didn't have a mission of agile transformation. Our mission was outwardly focused to make it easier to deliver business value, sooner, safer, and happier. We were focused on the business goals. And solving that problem requires all kinds of holistic improvements, not just you know, developers coding faster. It's communication. It's how we uh, break down work. It's how we uh, organize teams. And teams that took that mission seriously improved their culture, engineering, and value delivery. And he didn't simply give us the mission. He supported it with action. Yeah, because even a good mission is meaningless if the organization can't align to it. Mission alignment is super important. And deliver business value daily is a mission that supports the business goals. The value that we could reap from delivering daily was clear get faster feedback, 
This would allow us to be able to adjust quickly to our customers' changing needs. And this was announced in an all-company meeting when I was already ramping up for our second internal DevOps day and planning to launch a continuous delivery user community in order to keep conversations going. Our first DevOps day the year before had been really exciting, but all that momentum fizzled shortly after because it wasn't really clearly incentivized by leadership and there was nowhere to take the conversation. Now, because we were aligned to the mission from the top down, the community took off very quickly and it allowed developers to work together across teams and areas to solve problems. So by building a grassroots community across the organization that encouraged communication and open sharing, we were able to grow trust and reduce silos and that allowed us to progress on our mission together. That's fine to have a mission, but if we're not aligning the structure around the organization to achieve it, it's just wishes and dreams. To improve the flow of delivery, we need to improve the supply chain of communications. That's really the problem we're trying to solve with software development. And doing that requires understanding and optimizing the supply chain. We need a structure that reflects the outcomes we want. You know, Conway's law says that the system will resemble the organization's communication structure to build them. And I've personally lived this. I've lived uh, with random teams, built, uh, the, you know, feature teams, all contributing randomly to a, a giant system and generating spaghetti code. I've also had seen deliberate organizational structure allow us to break things down to where we have a much better architecture and achieve that greatness we're after. And teams should be deliberately architected for improved communication. We align them to business capabilities, they become business domain experts, and they can be decoupled from each other to allow independent value delivery. I spoke earlier about the successes we saw early on. A critical part of that success was moving away from feature teams and reorganizing teams around discrete business capabilities. Instead of attempting to manage complexity with process, we were able to reduce the complexity with deliberate team design that mirrored our desired system or this design. We built an org structure and engineering standards based on decoupling teams. This allowed teams to deliver independently rather than release trains and manage dependencies with process. Engineering worked much better than process management. And accidental structure is not sustainable. It immediately creates tech debt. If you have feature teams, they result in accidental architecture because they're accountable for delivering features without having the full context of the overall business capability. And functional silos that are often driven by the reporting structure end up resulting in heavy handoffs and process overhead. Individual responsibility for a product makes the system unsupportable when that person leaves, moves to another team, or maybe even <laughs> just out sick for a week. I've also seen individual responsibility given which resulted in a product where the technology used was not well understood by any team in the area, let alone the team that ultimately had responsibility to support it. And the product was not even correctly adjusting the business needs because it had been built in a silo. Deliberate structure not only improves the flow of communication, but also helps to forge our next link, ownership. And ownership means more than just being held accountable. Um, teams that own their solutions really care about the outcomes and want to be responsible for them. Now, you, it's really easy to destroy ownership. You know, it's all we have to do is dictate to teams how they work. You know, everybody has to use Scrum or assign individuals sole responsibility for delivering features. It sounds like ownership, but it's the wrong kind. Uh, treat people as resources rather than domain experts. And treating people as fungible resources degrades value delivery. I once worked with a team where the, the manager wanted a good way to evaluate how well individuals were doing on the team. So the way he chose was to evaluate how many Jira tickets they closed on average per week. Well, what that resulted in was everybody was focusing inwardly on what they were trying to get done. You had senior engineers who should have been leading the technical direction of the team focused on closing Jira tickets. 
You had people who needed help, not getting help because helping one in person meant that I wouldn't be able to close my Jira ticket as fast. Code reviews were delayed. Uh, it just impacted everything about the supply chain of delivering software, but the manager had an easy way to evaluate people. So his HR goal was met. Yeah, and ownership's really important for quality. Quality is the outcome of ownership because teams that are in touch with the user feedback and feel responsible for their happiness because they own the product and they own the entire process. They want to make a quality product. When teams are allowed to innovate and solve the problems, they're proud of the solution they bring. They have pride. They want to ensure that what they deliver is not just functional, like we might think of for you know, QA testing, but let's talk about what quality really means, right? That it's reliable, functional, secure, and compliant. And I'll tell you, I've, I've had operational responsibility for the software I've written for most of my career, and I assure you that ownership drives quality. At three o'clock in the morning, I feel deeply uh, the ownership. But ownership doesn't mean the teams own everything. It means they own the problems, the solutions, and the outcomes. I recently saw an article that about devs don't want to do ops. Well, I mean, part of that was we don't want to do support, but uh, you know, suck it up. <laughs> but part of it was also that the, the, the teams were overloaded with complexity, that people thought that DevOps meant the teams owned all of the infrastructure for delivering everything. That adds way too much complexity and slows down delivery. Teams should be focusing on the business uh, capabilities are supposed to deliver, not how to deliver. We need platforms to make that easy. Having a common platform will enable us to leverage the tools that help support all the other links. Um, you know, as Brian says, platforms should make the right thing easy and make the wrong things painful. Exactly. The platforms should not just be tools. They should be uh, enable and encourage improvement. And how we implement this in platforms will have a dramatic impact on our improvement goals. Are the platforms acting as gatekeepers and police or empowering better outcomes by making it harder to make mistakes, adding guardrails? Platforms can absolutely harm our efforts if they are not aligned with the mission, if they ignore the responsibilities to make the tools easy to use and hard to abuse, if they act as policy police instead of making policies easy to follow and transparent. If instead of platform as a service, the platform is implemented as, like Dana says, platform as a service ticket. And I once worked in an organization where establishing a new delivery pipeline required a ticket, two weeks of waiting while another team built the pipeline. This not only impacted the ability to scale the platform due to the operational overhead of having that as a practice, but it also had a direct impact on the architecture and quality process decisions of the teams that use the platform. I'm not going to go and build a microservice architecture if I need a microservice architecture, if it takes me two weeks to stand up another microservice framework. I'm not going to add a new quality gate if I have to go and ask permission to add another quality gate. I'll just kind of get it done with what I have. I have a work to do. It's about the solution, not the tools. Um, a centralized self-service platform allows for that continuous improvement and hardening of the pipelines. Um, you know, like Brian just said, if it's self-service, if I'm allowed mm -hmm. to add my own gates, if I'm allowed to, you know, do things, um, that and be able to not have to wait two weeks. My pipeline is gonna work for me as a developer. It's going to accomplish its goal of being a solution that can be leveraged to help and not hinder development. And with that being centralized, security and compliance standards can be built in. Um, you know, this doesn't mean that teams can't add their own, but basic standards can be built in, which gives the organization confidence that every delivery is meeting those that set of standards without teams being able to forget to add it in or turn them off. So yeah. a centralized platform that's built to meet those right outcomes bakes good engineering practices into the culture. It becomes just the way we do things throughout the entire organization. 
you know, honestly, if you have security and compliance as a, as a thing you want, and you expect it to just man, manually, magically happen, it's just security and compliance theater. You, the platforms have to be there to make it easy to implement and hard to forget. And the reason platform teams exist is to make value delivery easier and to make mistakes harder if they're done correctly. And as a friend of mine said once, it's the, the reason for platform is to reduce the average level of unhappiness. I, I don't like that way of thinking as a platform mm -hmm. engineer. Yeah. And, you know, by definition, platforms are going to enable many new capabilities. You know, if they're done right, they're changing the way we work. And to use them effectively, we have to unlearn old habits, let go of the way we used to do things, and learn some new ways which brings us to learning, right? DevOps takes a different mindset. Um, yeah, we all say we have a DevOps transformation happening. Well, transformation itself means to really change the way you think or a holistic change that requires learning new things. But it's really important to focus learning on the right things for the right reasons. Are we going out to collect certifications so that we can feel awesome about ourselves? Or are we learning things that we can use to actually improve how and what we deliver? I mean, I like certs. And we got a whole wall full of them, right? The wrong approach to learning, though, can result in everyone just feeling overloaded and burning out just trying to keep up. Or not learning at all, which quickly degrades the value that we can deliver. Um, you know, we can really screw it up if we don't have rapid feedback loops because we're not able to incrementally learn as we go. Um, the mindset that learning is an interruption. We can't stop working to learn, whether it's to learn a new skill or learn how to do something better. That mindset is, it hurts my head, honestly. <laughs> when learning is not aligned with our goals and relevant to fulfilling our customers' needs, then it it is an interruption. So maybe that's where that comes from, right? If we're not focused on the right things, it does interrupt our work. Surveying developers to see what cool new tech they want to learn that's not related to any work that they're responsible for, or changing tech stacks just because it's cool, not better for the actual product use case, only adds cognitive load. So, you know, another thing that can really screw it up is having insufficient focus on training, uh, not prioritizing leadership training, not offering time or opportunities to attend training and improve relevant skills as part of the job. If developers shouldn't be required to be security and quality hobbyists. It's part of the job. And technology and customer needs change so rapidly. We can't afford not to learn daily and use what we learn to keep improving. But learning also requires some unlearning. Uh, DevOps tends to be difficult because it requires looking at things very differently, which can be hard to understand if we don't kind of step back and unlearn the old ways. We have to set aside what we knew before and not be afraid to really change. You know, we can no longer wait till our product is big and shiny and perfect to deploy. By then, our competitive advantage could be gone, or the needs of our customers have probably changed. Um, there's now no end, so we can't possibly inspect for quality and security when we're done coding. And there's no time for manual auditing. As if that would be effective anyway. Yeah. Sure. So we need to prioritize learning. We need to make the goals of the mission part of onboarding new people so that they have context. We can't focus learning only on individuals. Learning needs to encompass how teams work together in their context. You don't get a good sports team by hiring a bunch of people, training them individual skills and throwing them on the field. Learning isn't limited to people doing the work. The people managing the work must learn too. They are part of the value stream and need to understand how their actions impact value delivery. Everyone at every level must prioritize learning. As Dana said, learning isn't extra work. It's the daily job. It's what we do. And we're going to have failures along the way. 
to stay stay is to stay safe. We need to learn from those as well. We need to identify the problems in our system instead of blaming the people who work in the system. Blaming people reduces quality and makes us less secure because blaming people causes fear. The pragmatic approach to improving the system is for people to feel safe enough to be transparent while uncovering the causes. Transparency requires the next link, trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is foundational. It's the first constraint to improving outcomes. If you go back to that early success I talked about at the beginning, it all came down to our senior vice president trusted us. He gave us a mission and just trusted us. He listened to what we had to say and helped us clear roadblocks along the way because he trusted we knew what we were doing. I, the trust is also fragile. It's the most fragile of the links. It takes a lot of effort to build trust and no effort to destroy it. And when trust is missing on a team, in an organization, um, you know, if the organizational mission is not trusted, people are not ready to rally around it. People aren't going to talk together. They're not going to support it. Innovation is going to suffer. Progress is going to be slow. And the individuals working within the organization have a hard time feeling purpose in their work when they don't understand that mission or don't trust leadership. They're going to fear sharing their ideas and have a tendency to hide their mistakes and not ask questions. So how do we screw up trust? It's pretty simple, really. First, just take ownership from the people doing the work and make them do it your way. Just be aware that you're now responsible for the outcomes and the quality. Or measure individual performance rather than the health of the system. Or just set arbitrary deadlines or create stretch goals to encourage maximum effort because we can't trust that people are really focused on delivering maximum effort because they they believe in what they're doing or have pride in their work. Let's, you know, let's just do that instead. Yeah. And, you know, common goals can really grow trust. So, you know, going back to kind of having that mission, having everything, um, aligned, having teams aligned within the organization. Um, when we have that common goal, you know, we can go and think back to um, Dr. Ron Westman's research on how information flows through organizations. And what he discovered was, you know, that, that a generative or what he also calls a performance oriented culture um, really had the best flow of information and therefore it makes a good environment for an organization and especially for DevOps. It's kind of, it's a requirement um, really for DevOps to thrive. Um, and we see that talked about in the book Accelerate. But his, his research showed that, you know, Having a performance-oriented culture, a culture that's focused on the mission, on the outcomes that are being produced, allows the people that are involved to kind of put aside their personal issues because their focus is on those outcomes. They're going to share their successes and share their hardships together. They're going to constantly communicate to try to get to that mission together. And that establishes a higher level of trust both across the organization and up and down the hierarchy. When you're focused on outcomes, you're looking at the overall system, not the people. In a generative culture, we're growing trust by working on the system together rather than looking at individuals and assigning blame. And then people are not afraid because they know they won't be blamed. And fear is the biggest enemy of trust. It's super important to build trust. And the first step is to align on the desired outcomes and establish a team approach to achieve them. There's an organization that I talked to recently that you know metrics are a big thing. 
but a lot of teams fear metrics. But in this organization, the CTO has developed such a level of trust with the teams. The teams are eager to show their delivery metrics and how much improvement they've made to delivering business value. It's really inspiring what a good leader can do when they build trust. Yeah, and we don't, you know, we haven't really addressed the metrics as much um, through this, this, these links. However, you know, misusing metrics is the, the number one way to abuse that trust. Yeah, you can break it down. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, those are the six links. Those, you know, mission, structure, ownership, platform, learning, and trust. They're all equally important to sustain a culture of improvement that's focused on people first, process, and then product and tools to deliver value to our customers. When these links are strong, the organization is focused on the mission and providing value to the customers. <clears throat> the improvement mindset is baked into the organizational culture. It's just what we do. DevOps tools aren't the focus. Now they're leveraged for consistency and automation that's super important, but they're leveraged alongside the quality processes that are needed to back them up. The organization's foundational culture exhibits high trust and encourages innovation and learning. That's what builds the strong foundation from these things. The system depends on the chain and we need to avoid breaking it. If we have a mission that's not aligned to business value, structure not aligned to improving communication and to improve delivery goals. If we have accountability without ownership. If we have platform as just an infrastructure service desk rather than an enabler of value delivery. If learning isn't focused on system improvement or we have a culture of fear and bureaucracy instead of trust. When we first build these links, they're made of paper, fragile, easily broken. We need to forge them in steel. And so let's look at some ways to build and measure them. So, I mean, first off, let's just check the pulse, right? Check the pulse of your teams. How are we doing, right? Um, and organizational and team level can perform various surveys. There's lots of resources out there about surveying for the psychological safety levels on a team, a team processes, net promoter score, all different kinds of, of surveys, depending on what information you're trying to look for. Um, one of the things that we get just by performing a survey, and no matter what the topic, is are people engaged or are they not engaged, right? Um, engagement says a lot about the environment. Is there even enough trust to, to share opinions and answer a survey? Lack of engagement can be a sign of unhappiness and low trust. So it's really important to take a look and keep your, keep your thumb on the engagement level. A Gemba walk. Gemba um, means actual place in Japanese. It comes, uh, the Gemba walk concept comes from uh, manufacturing when the managers would go down to the floor to the actual place the work was being done to see what was going on and actually talk with the employees. Um, Good idea, so they do it better. Exactly. The game boat walk, um, you know, going out and talking with your teams, <clears throat> talking amongst each other, that helps really to um, build the empathy, start building those open communication channels. Um, because Visibility of work and open communication are super important. You know, that brings us to another thing that you can look at and, and measure is, you know, are we are the teams being secretive or are they openly sharing? Um, do we see the work that's being done? Do we have open chat channels or is every team talking in a little enclosed space? I, I once had a manager who did not want to share what we were doing with anyone because he was afraid someone was going to steal his idea and get it to market first within the company, within the company. He didn't want us to ask our stakeholders what they wanted because then it would seem like we weren't smart enough to just understand their needs from, from a quick one sentence ask, right? Um, 
you know, hiding those conversations, hiding those conversations, hiding work in progress shows a really strong sense of fear and low trust environment. That sharing is really needed, open communication sharing to get the feedback, to learn from each other, learn from our customers, eliminate duplication of efforts within and across teams. And yeah, what I think, I say, use the culture to drive the culture, right? Be the culture that you want in order to inspire others. Garner trust by trusting those that you work with and inspire engagement and open communication by being open yourself. So feedback loops are another thing that we can really look at and kind of measure. Um, you know, we learn from feedback loops, uh, but we can also learn by measuring the effectiveness of our feedback loops. Are our surveys useful? Can we take action based on the responses? Do we get rapid feedback from our customers to allow us to adjust, learn, improve, and ensure that we are always focused on the most important thing for them? You know, we need to focus on performance indicators that drive behavior and actually lead, lead to actions. Are our feedback loops creating noise or are they acting as catalysts for improvement and change? Metrics that matter are the metrics that we can learn from and use to drive improvement. If we're not using it, it's waste. Another thing, obviously, that we can measure our platform stability and scalability, right? Developer platforms are most successful when their goal is to lower the complexity of delivery. So, you know, how do we, how does the platform minimize the operational overhead? Are people having to do manual configurations? Is it platform as a service ticket? Or is it truly platform as a service? Is it self-service? low friction for the developer. You know, how long does it take to onboard? Can we grow the number of users without needing to grow the number of people required to support the users? Are we successfully reducing duplication of effort by centralizing the platform? And are we removing that friction and improving it? Are we being a roadblock as a platform team? Our platform solution, is it a roadblock or is it enabling our developers? Developer experience is just as important as customer experience. You know, and platform teams should really focus on understanding their customer, other developers. Absolutely. And, you know, teams who own problems, own the solutions, own the outcomes, also improve the most critical metric, pride. I've written about this before that if you, if you want to measure one metric, because everyone wants the one metric, the one metric that matters really is annoying. pride. If I have an emotional attachment to what I'm building and I understand and believe in the value it delivers, I want it to be good. I mean, guarantee I'm going to work every day to make it good. I want people to want to like it. And value stream mapping is also an incredibly important metric. We want to avoid structure changes focused on inward goals rather than outward goals. We don't want to build teams because it makes it easier to manage them. We want to build teams because it makes it easier to deliver business value. We need to, um, need to measure and understand the communication supply chain. And that's really what a value stream map is. Value stream maps help us understand how structure changes impact delivery and help us to design those changes to minimize communications, frictions, and dependencies between teams. How we minimize handoffs, remove waste. Yeah, the value stream mapping is really how your teams got started when you got to help a, a team. Yeah, and you know, uh, when I was mostly focused on helping teams with continuous delivery, the very first thing is understand the communication supply chain. Value stream map the teams, understand where they had, inter you know, constraints and communication between the teams, like two or three code reviews or they have to go and talk to another team just to deliver or another team just to test, you know, how do we improve that communication, uh, remove those dependencies and make it easier and faster to deliver value so we can get faster feedback on if it was the right thing to deliver in the first place. Right, and sometimes that would involve just restructuring the teams. If we had a, if there's a team of 15 people, maybe 
being able to split out into smaller dimensions. I've made that recommendation many times. Don't be afraid to really change. Yep. <laughs> and another one is a, a metric I proposed recently is mean time to leadership change. Leaders change. And, but the organization needs to be resilient to that. When leaders changes, the mission changes. But our efforts to improve how we deliver the mission should not. The links must be strong enough to hold up the entire chain during a change in leadership. We need to work to create broad understanding and support for those links. Everybody at every level needs to be bought in so that it doesn't destabilize things when the leaders on board. Focusing on baking the links into the culture will allow us to change missions while maintaining our ongoing effort to improve how we deliver that mission. It shouldn't just all fall apart. How resilient is our organization to improvement? So if you really want to achieve actual improvement and start to make changes to deliver better value, sooner, safer, and happier, to coin John Smart's phrase, you know, start by evaluating these links in your environment and use them to forge a strong organization, right? Start by aligning, make sure that you're aligned on a meaningful mission. If not, really take a look at that and figure out what would be meaningful and what could start building up to support. Reduce your delivery friction by creating deliberate structure. Give teams ownership so that they feel the pride to deliver better outcomes. Centralize platform solutions. Make the right things easy. Bake in security and compliance. And continuously improve the system by learning and unlearning. And I can't stress enough how important the unlearning is. <clears throat> I mean, we really, sometimes in DevOps, we have to, when we start delivering faster, we even have to have our customers unlearn a little bit, you know? Hey, we're not getting quarterly releases. They're going to be full of bugs. We're going to get daily releases. They're going to be very small changes, and you're not going to have to be afraid of the release anymore. But sometimes that sounds terrible to them. Oh, my God, you're going to give us more bugs faster, is their thought. They have to unlearn that and realize that we're not working the same way, right? And finally, build a generative culture of trust by collaborating on the common mission. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope that we have given you some things to think about. We would love to hear feedback and questions. Um, we will we'll take a look at questions in the Slack channel. Um, you can reach me also on LinkedIn or on Twitter. I, for me, really, um, LinkedIn is your, your best bet. <laughs> I do have a Twitter account, but uh, yeah. Yeah, you can also reach me on LinkedIn and Twitter. And also, you know, reach out at brian.fenster at defenseunicorns.com. I'm happy to talk about really challenging delivery problems. You know, uh, it's, I'm passionate that good platforms can help enable this, but they're not the final solution. And we've also put a list of resources we recommend together that you can reach either with that QR code. We promise it's not going to take you somewhere strange. <laughs> We're both very much into security. Um, but also at this bit.ly link, the rise and fall of DevOps. Uh, hopefully those resources will help you out. There's a, a lot of rich material that we've leveraged over the years that hopefully will help you. With that, thank you very much and uh, look forward to chatting uh, with Q&A later. Thank you.